Welcome back to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. Our hearing, uh, which started this morning at 9 a.m., will now continue. Um, just a reminder that this is a public hearing to solicit comments on the petition requesting the commission initiate rulemaking under the Federal Hazardous Substance Act to declare several categories of products containing additive organohalogen flame retardants to be, quote, banned hazardous substances, end quote. We have heard from four panels this morning, and uh, we are going to now hear from our fifth. Uh, on this panel, we are pleased to have Ms. Katie Huffling from the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, Ms. Jenna Reed, Union of Concerned Scientists, Mr. Robert Science, excuse me, Mr. Robert Simon from the American Chemistry Council. And while Mr. Simon is presenting, I would just say that Mr. Mike Walls from the American Chemistry Council will also be available to answer questions. And on the phone, we have uh, Ms. Sonia Lunder from the Environmental Working Group joining us, along with Dr. Hebbles, uh, Heather Stapleton from Duke University and Ms. Pamela Miller from the Alaska Community Action on Toxins. Thank you all very much for joining us today. And again, each one of the panelists will testify for up to five minutes. The yellow light indicates you have one minute remaining. And for those of you on the phone, um, Ms. Mills will alert you when you have one minute left. Once all the panelists have concluded their testimony, uh, we will turn to the commission for five minute rounds of questions. With that, Ms. Hovling, you may begin. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity to comment today on the petition requesting rulemaking on products containing organohalogen flame retardants and the CPSC staff briefing package. Again, my name is Katie Hoffling, and I'm the executive director of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. I'm also a nurse and a nurse midwife. The Alliance is the only national nursing organization that focuses solely on the intersection of health and the environment. Our mission is to promote healthy people and healthy environments by educating and leading the nursing profession, advancing research, incorporating evidence-based practice and influencing policy. We have over 3,000 members throughout the country. Our members include nurses from all walks of our profession, hospital-based, public health, school-based, and advanced practice to just name a few. Nurses are the most trusted profession, and we take our duties very seriously when providing education to patients and working to prevent disease. The main work of our organization occurs through the generous volunteer work of our nurses. Through our policy and advocacy work group, these nurses have led engagement of health professionals on the serious issues related to flame retardants and health. Our work has been guided by the American Nurses Association's resolution, Nursing Practice, Chemical Exposure, and Right to Know which advocates a course of action that reduces the use of toxic chemicals, demands adequate information on the health effects of chemicals and chemicals and products before they are introduced on the market, and creates more streamlined methods for toxic chemicals to be removed from use. Based on this resolution, nurses need to advocate for consumer products that are free of toxic chemicals as part of their standard of practice. I am highly concerned that pregnant women, the growing fetus, and our children are being exposed to halogenated flame retardants every day. It's my job to help women have the healthiest pregnancies possible. As such, I recognize the importance of having normal levels of thyroid hormones during pregnancy and monitor for symptoms of thyroid dysfunction so that action can be quickly taken if an abnormality is found. That this class of flame retardants are structurally similar to thyroid hormone and have been shown to disrupt thyroid hormone function is highly concerning. Thyroid disruption during pregnancy can have a negative impact on fetal brain development as well as other poor pregnancy outcomes as you've heard from other, others here today. With one in six kids in the U.S. now facing the lifelong challenge of developmental disabilities such as autism and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, we need to seriously address chemicals that could be a component of this alarming trend. I'm also concerned with the effects of halogenated flame retardants on fer fertility. Elevated PBDE levels in human breast milk has been correlated with cryptocortism as well as decreased testes size and decreased sperm counts. As infertility is increasing in this country, need, we need to be addressing these possible chemical origins. As a nurse midwife, I'm frequently asked which products are safe to use with their baby. Which nursing pillow would I recommend? What's the best crib to buy? 
Due to the limited consumer information we have on many of the flame retardants addressed in the petition, it can be very challenging as a provider to offer advice on the safest products. This is especially frustrating when it's been shown that these toxic chemicals are not even pro providing added flame protection. When speaking with my pediatric nurse colleagues, they have described that they have many ways we can counsel parents to reduce risks of fire, such as having working smoke detectors and not smoking in the house, but they have no meaningful advice to give to parents on how to reduce the risk of kids' exposures to flame retardants. Manufacturers are able to add these flame retardants to their products without labeling nor testing them for health effects. This entire class of halogenated flame retardants all have similar molecular structure and all are likely to react similarly in the body. We believe that due to the hazardous nature of these flame retardants and the high potential for harm, especially to the growing fetus and children due to critical developmental windows of susceptibility, that the CPSC is compelled to regulate these flame retardants under the Federal Hazardous Substance Act. Also, the staff brief states that OFRs may not be pervasive as they've been found in only 22% of the children's products tested by CPSC. This is not an insignificant number as children has numerous toys in their toy boxes. 22% can lead to significant exposures amongst this vulnerable population. Our next generation deserves to be able to grow up healthy and free of these toxic chemicals. Let's not make the mistake of regrettable substitutions and adopt the current proposal to restrict these unnecessary and health harming class of flame retardants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Reed. Good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank Chairwoman Burkle and the CPSC commissioners for the opportunity to testify before you today on this important issue. My name is Jenna Reed. I am the science and policy analyst at the Center for Science and Democracy at the Union of Concerned Scientists. With more than 500,000 members and supporters across the country, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit group dedicated to improving public policy through rigorous and independent science. The Center for Science and Democracy at UCS advocates for improved transparency and integrity in our democratic institutions, especially those making science based po public policy decisions. The Union of Concerned Scientists stands with other members of the scientific community in supporting this petition calling upon the Consumer Product Safety Commission to declare organohalogen flame retardants, OFRs, as a hazardous class of chemicals and to ban their use in children's products, furniture, mattresses, and the casings surrounding electronics. The scientific evidence laid out in the petition supports this regulatory change. The CPSC has the authority to protect the public from toxic substances that may cause substantial personal injury or substantial illness. Since the center's inception, we have worked to protect scientific integrity within the federal government and called attention to incidences of special interests mischaracterizing science to advocate for specific policy goals. The chemical industry and its trade association, the American Chemistry Council's work to sow doubt about the science revealing harms about chemicals impacts on our health including flame retardants, is an egregious example of this inappropriate behavior. The companies that manufacture OFRs have put significant time and money into distorting the scientific truth about these chemicals. As the 2012 Chicago Tribune investigative series noted, the chemical industry has twisted research results, ignored findings that run counter to its aims, and passed off biased industry-funded reports as rigorous science. In doing so, the American Chemistry Council and its member companies has promoted the prevalent use of OFRs at the expense of public health. Looking at these chemicals through a strictly objective lens illustrates the needs, need for CPSC's swift action. Toxicity and exposure data support the assessment of organohalogen flame retardants as a class of chemicals under the Federal Hazardous Substances Act. Properties that are shared by OFRs include their semi-volatility and ability to migrate from consumer products into house dust and exposure has been associated with a range of health impacts, including reproductive impairment, neurological impacts, endocrine disruption, genotoxicity, cancer, and immune disorders. As a class, there is an, an adequate body of evidence supporting the conclusion that these chemicals have the capacity to cause personal illness and therefore meet the definition of toxic under FHSA. Perhaps most egregiously, biomonitoring data have revealed that communities of color and low-income communities are disproportionately exposed to and bear high levels of flame retardant chemicals, adding to the cumulative chemical burden that these communities are already experiencing, from increased fine particulate matter from power plants or refineries in their neighborhoods to higher levels of contaminants in their drinking water. 
I've seen firsthand the persistence of the earliest form of flame retardants, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, that still plague the sediment and water of the Hackensack Meadowlands, just a couple of miles from where I grew up in New Jersey. One of my first jobs was working in the chemistry division of the Meadowlands Environmental Research Institute, where I spent my days extracting PCBs and organochlorine pesticides from the soil and sediment of the, of the Meadowlands and analyzing that data. Despite being banned in 1977, these chemicals are still found at dangerously high amounts all over industrial hotspots of the country and continue to bioaccumulate in a range of species. The ban of PCBs happened decades ago, and we are still managing the damaging impacts of the chemicals prevalence across the country. The next generation of these chemicals, organohalogen flame retardants, are inside of our own homes in a range of products, thanks largely in part to the disinformation campaigns sowed by special interests. The fact remains that the science does not support their continued use. Seeing firsthand the persistence of PCBs in my local environment inspired me to use my scientific training to work to design or improve policies that minimize public health and environmental risks and prevent future scenarios of chemicals overburdening ecosystems and households. That is why I'm here today to ask the CPSC to act with urgency to grant this petition and further regulate OFRs to protect our children and future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Simon. Thanks, Chair Burkle and Commissioners. My name is Robert Simon, and I'm here today testifying on behalf of the American Chemistry Council and the North American Flame Retardant Alliance. Uh, I know there's a lot of interest in this issue, and we were trying to help facilitate the Commissioner's request to consolidate some of the testimony. So I'm going to present remarks on behalf of both myself and Mike Walls from the American Chemistry Council. I'll try and be brief. Um, just a quick comment. And, I, I know we've been before the commissioners before on several issues, and I just want to emphasize that the American Chemistry Council represents the principal manufacturers of chemicals in the U.S., and we are fully committed to product safety. Uh, that, By nature of membership in the American Chemistry Council, you are obligated to comply with our responsible care program, which includes eight different codes, including our product safety code, and that's mandatory for obligation. That includes third-party verification and our new product safety code. But I just wanted to emphasize our commitment to overall product safety. Um, I'm here today speaking in support of the staff briefing package as it relates to the petition HB 151 and the staff recommendation to deny the petition. Um, I'm going to emphasize five key points today but our overall message to the commissioners, to the public, to some of the other stakeholders are today. This petition is overly broad. It will increase fire risk and it um, is not consistent with the FHSA. So my testimony focused on five key points. First, fire safety, as the commissioners well know, is a critical uh, issue for the CPSC to consider. Um, we've made a lot of progress over the last 40 years in reducing fire risk. A lot of that has come as a result of the CS, um, uh, CPSC's leadership on that issue. And flame returns have played a role in that in terms of helping reduce the fire risk of products. Having said that, as you all know from, from the number of um, product recalls and product challenges that are out there, that fire risk is still a very real issue. According to the CPSC's own data, we respond to a fire every 23 seconds in the U.S. So that important notion of fire safety needs to be considered as part of this. Um, and I would just emphasize that in the review of this petition, this has the potential to undermine fire safety and even compromise the fire safety of some products. So encourage the CPSC to carefully consider that in the context of its review of this petition. Second point would be, um, as you've heard, I think even acknowledged by some of the, uh, the advocates for this petition, this is an incredibly broad petition. You're, you're banning an entire class of chemicals. Um, flame retardants include a broad range of products with differing characteristics, formulations, and intended uses, and it's just not appropriate to group all of these things together. Uh, to take that one-size-fits-all approach just doesn't make sense. Um, the hazard and risk profile of even these substances within this class of chemicals is just not the same, and that's been recognized by government agencies, including the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, so emphasize that point. The petition as it is currently defined would ban substances that other government regulators have determined do not present a risk and would also ban substances that haven't even been developed yet. 
So again, I, I, I urge the Commission to look at this holistically in terms of the, the broad implications of this. Um, good example would be under both Democratic and Republican administrations, new flame retardant products have been approved, including under the new Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act. This would run counter to that. A related point would be is um, the substances that are the subject of the petition have already been or are currently being reviewed for their safety by US EPA under a comprehensive new regulatory system in place for regulating chemicals. Um, the CPSC clearly has a critical and important role to play in consumer products, but he, this petition would duplicate some of the work that's already underway or has been done by US EPA to assess the safety of chemicals and regulate those chemicals. And a, a big piece of this, we were here with the last time testifying about hopefully the potential of the new Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act. Uh, after uh, the last hearing in January of 2016, it's glad here to say and uh, many of the people around this room, not just the chemical industry, but environmental groups, labor unions, et cetera, we worked to help pass the bipartisan Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act. That is a new law that has gone into effect. It significantly enhances the way we regulate chemicals in the U.S. and I think that's an important factor to consider. And I'll just end with an, a, a final point, which is because we, we believe this, the petition advances an inappropriate and very troubling application of the FHSA and, and should be denied. Um, I would just end with a, a comment uh, just directly from the staff package that I think emphasizes the broad nature of this. The FHSA requires consideration of the connection between the toxicity of a substance, exposure to that substance, through customary and reasonably foreseeable use of a product and resulting in substantial personal injury or substantial illness associated with the exposure. Staff considers that the OFRs represent a broad class of chemicals defined largely by their functional use and the presence of either bromine or chlorine. The data on OFR, OFRs show varying toxicity and exposure potential among individual OFR compounds. These varying properties of individual, individual OFR compounds indicate that OFRs are in fact represent several subclasses of chemicals and should not and should be examined separately and one cannot conclude that all substances would be considered uh, uh, hazardous substances under the FHSA. That's part of the reason why we uh, encourage the commission to take into account the staff report and the science on these issues. Appreciate the opportunity to testify today and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you Mr. Simon. Ms. Lunder. Hello, thanks for including me um, and allowing me to testify by phone. My name is Sonia Lunder and I'm a senior analyst at the Environmental Working Group, a nonprofit organization. Over the past 14 years, my organization, EWG, has performed original biomonitoring studies to document human exposure to organohalogen flame retardants. We've collaborate, collaborated with academic laboratories to measure PBDEs in paired serum samples from toddlers and their mothers, in mother's milk and umbilical cord blood. EWG has also partnered with Heather Stapleton's lab to measure metabolites of chlorinated tris and Firemaster 550 in preschool age children and their mothers. These studies suggest widespread exposure to toxic flame retardants, particularly during pregnancy, infancy, and early childhood. Children's exposures are commonly three to five times greater than their mothers. In its briefing package, the CPSC staff raised concerns about the petition's goal of banning all additive organohalogen chemicals. Yet dozens of studies have documented the way these chemicals contaminate the food chain, persist in the environment, and threaten human health. The testimony today documents a clear pattern of regrettable substitution, or as we learned today to call it, regrettable denial, where restrictions on a specific OFRs result in the use of new, poorly studied halogenated alternatives. Most recently, toxicity concerns have prompted four states, Maryland, New York, Vermont, and Washington, to ban two forms of TRIS in foam products. We see that without cl clear reg federal action to restrict OFRs as a group, a portion of the market will shift to new, poorly studied halogenated chemicals perpetuating this cycle. Most recent, um, sorry, organohalogen flame retardants share physical and chemical qualities that warrant their consideration as a group under the Federal Hazardous Substances Act. The halogen carbon bond imparts thermal stability, but also results in persistence and longevity of these chemicals in the environment and contributes to their toxicity to human health. When incinerated, they form highly toxic and persistent compounds like dioxins and furans. In response to this petition, the ACC cited an EPA press release claiming that the agency has identified 50 flame retardants that are unlikely to pose a risk to human health. But neither the ACC nor the EPA have stated whether any of these alternatives are halogenated. This statement is likely based on the analysis of EPA's Design for the Environment program. 
that was also mentioned earlier by Rick Gross in his testimony. In 2015, in a report, all of the 10 halogenated flame retardants that EPA examined were rated as high hazard in at least one category, either for their hazard to human health or environmental persistence and bioaccumulation. EPA did name two chemicals as a lower level of concern for polyurethane foam, but both were not halogenated. A study by Miriam Diamond, who will testify later today, reviewed 94 fire, fire retardants that could be substitutes for those currently used in consumer products. She found that 40% had medium or high concern for environmental persistence, and the rest posed a low concern, and concluded the replacement fire retardants have to be evaluated as a class because the one-by-one -one regulatory approach is problematic for ensuring that alternative flame retardants will be less hazardous than their predecessors. Despite an encouraging market shift away from additive flame retardants in household products, OFRs continue to be used in some new products, as noted in testimony today. We conclude that voluntary actions by manufacturers and state-by-state -state restrictions on individual chemicals are not sufficient to keep these chemicals out of new products. And we note that handheld XRF devices allow for rapid and affordable and non-invasive compliance monitoring, in fact, meaning that a category-wide ban on halogens could be simpler to enforce than a ban on specific OFRs. The CPSC staff allege that there is insufficient data to prove that these product categories in the petition are the source of OFRs measured in people. And they bring up the point that um, the chemicals are used in vehicles and also- One minute remaining. Thank you. But research has shown that consumer products are the primary source of human exposure to flame retardants. In our testimony, written to testimony, we attached this study finding that twice as many pounds of PBDEs were added to polyurethane foam in household products than vehicles. So in closing, we would urge the commission to grant the petition as written and ban organohalogen flame retardants in these four product categories. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Dr. Heather Stapleton. Dr. Stapleton, are you on the phone? I am, yes. Can you thank hear me? Thank you. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, yes, I'm Heather Stapleton. I'm an associate professor of environmental chemistry and exposure science at Duke University. My research has focused on identifying additive chemicals in consumer products, evaluating human exposure pathways, and investigating potential effects from exposure to flame retardants. For the past 17 years, I've been conducting research specifically on flame retardant chemicals, and I have more than 70 peer-reviewed publications focusing on this topic. Uh, in addition, I testified in front of the U.S. Uh, US Senate subcommittee uh, in May of 2012 on a hearing that focused on flame retardants. Today, I'd like to take a few minutes to summarize some important research findings that have been generated from my group, particularly over the last year, which directly relate to several issues raised today, specifically um, relating to our understanding of human exposure related to use of flame retardants in furniture and mattresses. Since 2008, my research group has been testing furniture products, particularly sofas, chairs, mattresses, and a number of baby items for flame retardant chemicals. As of today, we have tested more than 2,000 of these products, and we have a very good knowledge base regarding where flame retardants are used and how their use has changed over time. Contrary to what you have been told, our research has shown that flame retardants are actually used in adult mattresses sold on the market today, particularly mattresses made of memory foam, uh, and our data suggests this is not decreasing. We also know that companies are still applying flame retardants to furniture despite the change in the flammability standards from California. This was documented in our uh, publication in 2016. Uh, due to these, this research, my laboratory has been conducting its extensive biomonitoring studies to evaluate exposure among the general public and just to understand how exposure relates to product use. In a recent publication by Hoffman et al., we demonstrated that exposure to the halogenated organophosphate flame retardant, TDCPP, also known as chlorinated tris, has increased significantly among the U.S. population over the past decade. We also demonstrated that exposure to this chemical which is considered a carcinogen, is significantly greater in young children relative to adults. In fact, our research found that infants have the highest exposure to TDCPP among any age class, and furthermore, this exposure was significantly associated with the number of baby furniture items the parents owned in the home. This association is further supported by our testing program, which found that TDCPP is the most common flame retardant applied to baby furniture items that contain polyurethane foam. These studies provide a link connecting application of TDCPP in baby furniture items with exposure in infants. As a follow-up to this study, we recently estimated the average daily intake of TDCPP for an infant using our measurements of the urinary metabolite. 
we found that exposure ranged from 0.01 to 15 micrograms of TDCPP per kilogram body weight per day. When you compare that exposure to the acceptable daily intake for non-cancer health risks reported in a CPSC document in 2006, our results find that 2 to 9% of infants are currently receiving exposure that is higher than that threshold, suggesting some infants are receiving, receiving exposure that could result in health risks. This was also published earlier this year. To further understand relationships between flame retardant use in furniture and exposure among the general public, we recently conducted a separate study in which we actually sampled the cushions from sofas in 140 homes and collected paired samples of house dust and blood from participants residing in those homes. We found strong and statistically significant associations between the brominated flame retardants in the sofas and concentrations in the house dust and in the participants' blood. So for example, if a BFR, a brominated flame retardant, was present in the sofa, there were significantly higher levels of that flame retardant in the house dust and in the participant's blood compared to someone living in a home in which that brominated flame retardant was not in their furniture. This at the very least provides evidence that the use in sofas is linked with personal exposures in the home. These exposures are a concern given that new research demonstrates exposure to flame retardants is associated with reduced fertility and pregnancy in women and thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer is considered the fastest growing cancer based on incident One minute remaining. And we have recently published a paper which found statistically significant associations between the concentrations of three different flame retardants in house dust with thyroid cancer. And this uh, association was particularly strong for decabromodiphenyl ether, a brominated flame retardant. In closing, I believe this research, these research studies demonstrate unequivocally, unequivocally that use of flame retardants in these products is clearly tied with exposure among the general public. While I understand the fire risk is a very well-founded concern, we should think critically about technologies and approaches used to meet flammability standards. In my opinion, we should be absolutely avoiding the use of small molecule additives, which will always migrate out of products and result in some sort of exposure to just thermodynamics. Given the inherent challenges in evaluating hazard profiles for chemicals, it would behoove us to try and eliminate exposure rather than spending considerable time and effort trying to determine which chemical has a better toxicity profile. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Stapleton. Ms. Miller? Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. My name is Pamela Miller, and I am the Executive Director of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, a nonprofit environmental health and justice research and advocacy organization, and we're based in Anchorage, Alaska. We strongly support the petition and rulemaking to ban the class of organohalogen flame retardants from the four categories of consumer products, given the evidence of toxicity and hazards to human health. The Commission has an historic opportunity to make policy that will protect the health of millions of people across the U.S. who are routinely exposed to these harmful chemicals, and especially the health of vulnerable populations who are disproportionately exposed in their homes and workplaces. I am here to speak to the need of protecting vulnerable populations that might not be immediately obvious because they are distant from manufacturing centers but are nevertheless highly and disproportionately exposed, people of the North and Arctic, particularly indigenous peoples. We urge the Commission to consider the special vulnerability of Northern and Arctic indigenous peoples and their future generations when considering this petition. Far from pristine, the Arctic contains some of the most highly contaminated animals and people in the world. It is an important indicator region for assessing properties and effects of chemicals. Once chemicals enter the Arctic, their deterioration is slowed due to low temperatures and low-intensity sunlight, which makes them available for long-term incorporation into biological systems. Northern and Arctic peoples bear a burden of health disparities, including cancers, reproductive disorders, birth defects, learning and developmental disabilities. The fence line of chemical manufacturing, distribution, use, and disposal extends to the Arctic because chemicals can travel hundreds and thousands of miles on atmospheric and oceanic currents where they accumulate in the bodies of fish, wildlife, and people of the North in a process known as global distillation. People of the North, especially children, are likely to be more highly exposed to flame retardant chemicals in indoor environments because of the longer winters, the need to insulate against the cold and less ventilation in their homes. People experience high exposures through traditional foods as well as in their home environments. So this is really 
uh, a consideration of multiple exposure routes and high exposures. They also have limited choices in purchasing from retail stores in rural Alaska that sell inferior products. Chemicals are passed through successive generations from mother to child and harm the ability of children to learn their languages, traditional life ways, songs, stories, and knowledge. These neurotoxic chemicals are harming the brains and health of our future generation. Because these chemicals escape the products in which they are used through evaporation or weathering, many of these organohalogen compounds are now pervasive in the global environment. People are primarily exposed through inhalation, ingestion, and thermal absorption. Brominated flame retardants, including PBDEs and HBCD, are now ubiquitous in Arctic ecosystems with increasing levels in some areas, providing cause for concern. For example, concentrations of PBDEs found in the blood of Yupik people of the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta region of Alaska are the highest known human PBDE concentrations in the circumpolar Arctic. Concern is growing about new, largely unmonitored persistent chemicals that pose additional environmental threats in the Arctic, include, including the newer flame retardants that are unregulated at the national and global level. Several of these have been detected in Arctic marine mammals. One minute remaining. Are arriving through long-range transport. Recent studies demonstrate atmospheric persistent and long-range transport of a variety of these replacement flame retardants into the Arctic. Salamova measured concentrations of 45 chlorinated and brominated flame retardants in Arctic air samples, and Moeller in 2012 found two chlorinated uh, uh, chemicals, TCEP and TCPP, that predominate in the North Pacific and Arctic air samples. These are highly persistent in the Arctic due to low temperatures and darkness. Our own community-based research has demonstrated the presence of PBDEs in household dust, sentinel fish, traditional uh, food samples of marine mammals, and in the blood serum of the Yupik people of St. Lawrence Island, a remote island in the northern Bering Sea. Despite this, this remote location, PBDEs are ubiquitous in dust collected from St. Lawrence Island households, and human serum concentrations are similar to those found in elevated levels of the U.S. general population. Concentration of several of these PBDEs in dust are associated with serum concentrations, suggesting household dust is the source of these compounds even in remote populations. Finally, as co-chair of the International POPs Elimination Network, I'm very concerned that the lack of controls in the U.S. allows the dumping of products with unsafe levels of flame retardants into U.S. markets, including products that contain so-called recycled plastics contaminated by flame retardants from electronic waste. We urge the Consumer Product Safety Commission to use their authority to protect public health, particularly that of vulnerable populations, populations and ban flame retardants in children's products, furniture, mattresses, and household electronics. And I'd be happy to provide copies of some studies that IPEN has done showing high levels of flame retardant chemicals, including the brominated flame retardants and short-chain chlorinated paraffins in children's toys and other children's products. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. <clears throat> we will now begin our round of question from the commission from the dais. And I will begin that uh, line of questioning. Um, Ms. Huffling, in your testimony, you talk about uh, one in six kids in the U.S. now face the lifelong challenge of developmental disabilities. Can you cite the source of that, da of that information? Sure, I can send that to you. Okay, Definitely. good. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lunder, in your testimony, you talked about XRF technology that could detect flame retardants. I'm unaware of that. Can you speak to that? Yes, I am not an XRF expert, but XRF is a technology that can measure the bromine and chlorine elements in a compound. It's non-invasive, it's non-destructive, and those tools have been widely used to screen for the presence of chlorine and bromine in products and the detection of a high concentration of bromine and chlorine in any component of a, of a furniture product would allow uh, investigators or companies themselves to hone in on exactly what chemicals might be in there. And the finding of very low content of bromine or chlorine in a product would indicate that compliance with a ban on classes of organo 
chlorine or organobromine fire retardants in those four categories of products, pointing out that um, you know with non-invasive, non-destructive measures and a restriction across the category, XRF would be a great, cheap, um, rapid screening technology to enforce any restrictions on those compounds. Thank you very much. Mr. Simon, in your testimony you mentioned that if we take this broad approach and grant this petition and ban classes of chemicals, um, I should say ban this class of chemicals, that we will be banning chemicals that have already been uh, approved and determined to be safe. Could you just expand on that a little bit? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, just as some examples, but we know and there have been regulatory reviews of some of the chemicals that would be included in this petition that have gone through reviews not only in the U.S., but Canada, European Union, and have had those determinations that they do not present a risk to human health or the environment. So a good example of that would be TBBPA was one chemical that I think came up earlier today um, that has had regulatory determinations by both Canada and the EU. Um, and uh, that would be just one example there that would have a direct impact. You could provide additional, if you have other examples of that, I would I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Simon, uh, is it fair to say, based on your testimony and the testimony of your industry colleagues, that we're not likely to see a phase out of OFRs in consumer products unless the Commission takes regulatory action? I think the, what I would say to the commissioners would be is I think you will continue to see the use of flame retardants in applications that need uh, to meet certain fire, character, fire safety parameters and characteristics. And that would include OFRs? And that, right? would in, that would include OFRs. Okay. And uh, picking up on the chairman's point, you did cite the studies uh, with, by other agencies, and I assume you're referring to EPA, and I note in your testimony, your written testimony on page two, you say EPA has identified over 50, 50 flame retardants that it says are unlikely to pose a risk to human health. Uh, have you actually, or to your knowledge, any of your colleagues actually seen that list? I think that's an excellent question. I think this came up at our last hearing as it well. Did. Which, I'm uh, wondering what the answer is. We, ha we have not seen that list, and we, I think we have encouraged the CPSC to work with EPA to look at that list. I think the challenge we all have is some of those are proprietary products, and so they are not commonly available to particularly to a trade association that might represent different different company interests. And I just to ask your question earlier, uh, Commissioner Adler, I just want to emphasize, I think I would clarify my comment about the use of OFRs. If there are OFRs that present a risk, and there's clearly some that have been regulated, those will be regulated. So I, I just didn't want to leave that, uh, that open. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Uh, by the way, with respect to that list of 50, I think the reason that it's not accessible has less to do with the fact that it's proprietary than the fact that my understanding is EPA has withdrawn it and no longer stands behind that list of 50. I'm wondering the last time you checked and what the answer was given when you contacted them. Um, I, I don't have that information. I know we've asked EPA to make that publicly available to the extent that they can, even if it's not disclosing names. I think the Commission would probably have better access to that. I would also just say, though, it's not just limited to that re review that was done under the Obama administration. I know there was recently just a new PMN underneath the new Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act that does require an uh, affirmative safety determination that is an organo OFR, and it's been approved for certain uses. And so that's one other more, maybe more current example, and I think that is publicly available. Yeah, and, and just uh, picking up uh, on the chairman's request, I would really appreciate it, and I think we all would, if you would submit whatever list you have that uh, consists of OFRs in particular in consumer products that you believe uh, have been demonstrated present no uh, reasonable risk of uh, safety. Um, Ms. Huffling, um, at one point in your testimony, you said OFRs are not providing added flame protection. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that point. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll, I think a lot of the products that they're in, you know, we don't have babies that are smoking cigarettes laying on their mats or on um, nursing pillows um, that are really not needed in these types of products and it's just causing uh, more exposure to these potentially toxic chemicals where they're really not needed. Yeah, and, and Dr. Birnbaum this morning was saying, in effect, that the uh, OFRs in the concentrations that they're showing up in consumer products are really not providing significant uh, fire protection. Do you have any thoughts or comments about that as well? 
Yes, I would, I would agree with Dr. Birnbaum um, that they're not providing right. um, extra fire protection and instead are just exposing all of us to toxic chemicals. Uh, Ms. Reed, um, in your research, have you discovered any studies of OFRs, you've just heard the reference by Mr. Simon, that would lead you to conclude that there are any safe OFRs uh, or that there are OFRs yet to be discovered that share these same physical, chemical, biological characteristics as existing OFRs such that we should not take a class approach to regulating them? I have not, and I believe many of the people who have testified today, including Dr. Birnbaum, pretty much have the same, um, you know, belief in that um, there, ha there has not yet been one um, organohalogen flame retardant um, that could be, that wasn't linked to, you know, no harm. And Dr. Stapleton, may I direct that same question to you, uh, especially with respect to your recent research? Has any of your recent research led you to conclude that any known OFR presents little to no risk to humans, especially to children? Um, so I am not evaluating the toxicity of these independent chemicals. I'm evaluating their presence in products and how it relates to exposure um, and whether that's maybe associated with health risk. And so we've focused on a six to eight chemicals um, and not an expansive list that covers all halogenated flame retardants. So your issue is exposure as well as toxicity. Thank you very much. Commissioner Robinson. Dr. Stapleton, don't go away. I'm following up on this. Um, we, I, you know, in your testimony your, that was submitted in writing, you listed a bunch of uh, studies that you were involved in, several studies that you were involved in. And then in your testimony, you were testifying really quickly, and I was writing as fast as I could. But I want to make sure that I, my understanding is that you've done biometric studies that show that increased um, OFRs in kids' blood is associated with baby furniture with increased OFRs. Did I get that right? Yes. We, and we've shown that uh, infants have much higher exposure to the TDCPP, to chlorinated tris, it's considered okay. a carcinogen, which is associated with the number of baby products owned in the home. Okay. And can you tell me which one of the publications listed um, sure. is? Yeah, that's in that? the Hoffman et al. 2015 okay. publication cited. Perfect. Okay, and then the next thing that you said that I wrote down was that there was a strong association, and this um, was seemed to be with people, not just kids, with um, furniture with higher OFRs, finding more in the dust and in the blood of people. Correct. Um, and which which study supports that? That is the Hamill et al. 2017 publication cited in my written testimony. Great. Thank you so much. And. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Lundar, you said in your, you have footnotes 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 that's included in your attached to, uh, and in your written testimony. And the point seems to be that most of the OFRs in the dust in the home are the result of OFRs in household products. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, um, that is our, uh, the, the references we pulled to show the link between the, the household products and exposure of household residents. Okay. Although reference 16 is to make reference to the fact that more, twice as many PF, PBDEs were added to household furniture than to vehicles. Great. Um, and Mr. Simon, I, I know generally you said that you support the package and that um, you think that this ban would be overly broad, but I want to see if I can um, zoom in on that a little bit because the package, as I understand it, certainly found that OFRs are toxic, that they migrate from products and products with higher OFRs are associated with rooms with, hot, with more dust and that OFRs in blood are, if there are higher OFRs in blood that it's associated with adverse health impact. Do you agree with all of that? Don't worry, I'll get to your objection. But do you agree with that so far? No, I, I think I just wanted to clarify. I think it's very clear in the staff report that there is a recognition that not all of those substances are toxic, and there's even a chart that sort of indicates okay, that. Okay, so and I apologize that. because I phrased that poorly. All of the OFRs about which we have data sh show that they are, are are toxic, correct? No, I, I don't agree with that. Okay, which one, and your, which ones are not toxic that have been studied? Yes, I think there's a number of that, and that's one of our concerns about the broad approach is that you're regulating literally, you know, depending on 25 to 85 different chemicals. So, so you're, uh, and you, you're saying that there are studies of non-polymeric <laughs> non additive 
organohalogens that show that some of them are safe and not toxic. Is that what you're telling us? Yes. Okay. And, and so you're the only witness who said that today, so if you okay. can give those to us, that would be great. Happy to do so. Um, and, but you agree that if there's elevated OFRs in furniture, it's associated with higher OFRs in dust in the room? Or would you disagree with that as well? I'm sorry, Commissioner, could you clarify that question? If it's higher? If there are higher, if furniture in the room has higher OFRs, it's associated with higher OFRs in the dust in the room. Do you agree with that? I would say it depends on the OFR, and that's one of our concerns is that you're lumping everything together and just because but The ones one, that we've done studies of, you, you disagree with that as well? I, I would say you'd have to clarify what the source of the OFRs were. It, should, it might not just be furniture. It could be other sources, and that's an important determination. And that was the basis of my, my question, is that if you have furniture with high OFRs, do you agree or disagree that it's associated with higher OFRs in the dust in the room? Again, I would say it depends on the OFRs and also the application that it's used in. And if there are higher OFRs in the room, in a room, and people live in that room, would you agree that with kids, it's associated with higher OFRs in the blood and the urine? Yeah, I, I, I just want to be clear. I'm not trying to avoid your question. I'm trying to actually clarify. Different OFRs are used in different matrices. They okay. may migrate or, or uh, be emitted at different levels okay. or maybe not at all. And that's why I'm just so reluctant to say so broadly that Yes, that is And I, I tried to make it clear at the beginning of the day that when I say OFRs, I'm re referring to exactly what we're dealing with in this petition, the non-polymeric additive organohalogens. And of those, you disagree it's a risk, you disagree it's, it, it, it caught, that if it's in furniture at elevated rates, that it's associated with the dust being elevated in the room, and you disagree that it's associated with elevated blood and urine. Is that fair to say? Just to clarify, disagree that all OFRs present a risk and that all OFRs okay. are associated with higher So dose. of any of those that, that we ha are dealing with, if you could t tell us what studies would support what your view is since it's so different than any person who's testified today. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Simon, I think you did mention at least one of them, though, and correct me, please, if I'm wrong, TBBPA. Did you mention that as one that had been exonerated? And what's your understanding of the, so, of the studies associated with that particular chemical? Um, that, uh, you know, th overall when you look at the total exposure for that chemical, it does not present a risk to uh, human health or the environment. And we've done uh, some supporting science that looks at meta-analysis of the data that's out there. Just to use that as an example, levels of TBBPA that are out there are 7 million times below those that would likely cause health effects. So they think that's just a very concrete example, and that's what led governments like Canada and EU to make that determination. I think it's important to note, though, that ongoing study is always appropriate, and you always want to make sure of that. I know there is ongoing research associated with TBBPA sponsored by the industry and also by governments, and so it is something that we should look at, but there's clearly been a regulatory determination there. And you referred earlier to the staff chart, I believe, and I'm looking at page 99 of the staff briefing and under the, on the chart where it says TBBPA, it checks off toxicity associated with acute toxicity, chronic toxicity, reproductive development toxicity, neurotoxicity, uh, genetic toxicity, and chronic to uh, human toxicity, and labels it as a chronic toxic chemical. And so how does that square with your view that it has been found not to be toxic? You know, as, as with any chemical, it's a function of both hazard and exposure. And so it's important to look at that exposure component. I think that's what's been missing today. I think for what it's worth, what I was referring to was in the staff chart as related to, is it toxic underneath the FHSA? And clearly, when you look at the exposure levels, that does not present a risk. And that was, that was what I was alluding to. So I apologize for any um, confusion there. So what's unique about TBBPA that even if it's toxic, it, there's no exposure to it? I think it's a combination of it. There's varying levels of toxicity, and so that's one, and I think even uh, Dr. Stapleton referenced that. Um, so that's, that's number one. So just because something has the potential to be toxic, it could vary at different ranges. It could be more toxic, less toxic. And the second is the exposure piece. And so I think it's clear that TBBPA is not at levels of exposure, and that's why I was reluctant in response to Commissioner Robinson's question to um, automatically say that all OFRs generate large levels of exposure. So the study that you're referring to or the metadata 
uh, meta-analysis associated with the studies, if I'm understanding you correctly, don't take issue as much with the toxicity, but more with the lack of exposure. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And in your mind, those studies exonerate this chemical and remove it from consideration? I think classic toxicology would say that if, if you're not exposed to something at a level that's likely to cause adverse effects, that yes. And Dr. Stapleton, do you agree with the characterization about the exposure associated with that chemical? I, I think there's a, thank you for asking me, because there's a key point that's missing here, is that TBBPA, more than 90% of its use, it is a high production volume chemical, is used in a reactive form, which means it's chemically bound to the products it's attached to and less likely to leach out, leading to exposure, which is why that exposure risk is so little for TBBPA. If that were to change and be used more in an additive form, exposure would certainly go up. It depends on how it's used in the product, and that relates to the risk. Got it. Is that consistent, Mr. Simon, with your understanding? A a absolutely. I think that's consistent. I think that quote was very important. It depends on the use of the product. So it sounds product. like if it's in an additive, it's not being used in an additive form, so your company shouldn't have a problem with it being banned in products in that form. Uh, it is used in an additive form, and I think uh, just on principle, we're reluctant to see here you've made determinations by governments that this does not present a risk, and yet you're still going to ban it. And th that's, I think, a fundamental policy decision for the commission, but that's one of the issues we have with the petition overall. And those determinations by governments you're going to provide to us? Absolutely. Great. And, and we, I think we provided those after the last January hearing, because I think that those are critical, and we'll definitely share those and make sure those are available to everyone. And one of the comments that uh, Dr. Osimitz made was that there is a sea change in the thinking of companies now, and if they find a molecule that is harmful, they won't, they'll stop production. Is that something that you're familiar with? I, I think overall as a society, we're much more aware of uh, chemical issues and chemical management issues. I alluded to our responsible care program that has a product safety code, imposes certain obligations on our members from developing a product to end to life, so I think there's much more awareness. I would also say, again, we've come a long way in some of our chemical regulation. It's going to be very hard to introduce a new chemical that has some of the issues that we've all talked about here today. I think that's a good thing, and I know that's something that, that you've, in particular, been an advocate for for a long time, and that it helps avoid this issue of sub regrettable substitution and making sure we're thoughtful as we look at product design. Uh, I regret my time has expired. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Mohorovic. No questions. Thank you. At this, this time, then, we will um, end this fifth panel. And again, our sincere appreciation to all of you for being here, for your willingness to testify. And we will take a few minutes to switch to our sixth panel. And again, my sincere thanks. Thank you. Welcome back to this public meeting. We're going to continue uh, our final panel for today. And the uh, six people who are joining us this afternoon are on the phone, so we uh, have no one sitting in front of us. But let me say to all of you, and thank you for being here, if we could just, I'll call your name, if you could just confirm with me that you are on the line, that would be very helpful. Uh, Ms. Burmeyer? Good afternoon. Hi. Thank you. Dr. Singla? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And can I confirm that you are going to have a PowerPoint to show us that we have it, but I, that you're planning on showing it? Yes, that's correct. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Diamond? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Curtis? I'm here. Dr. Herbstman? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And, and uh, uh, Ms. Dr. Zeller? Yes, I'm here. Very, very uh, good. Thank you all very much. And at this point, we will ask uh, Ms. Bur Ms. Burmeyer to begin her testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Nancy Burmeyer. I'm the Senior Policy Strategist for the Breast Cancer Prevention Partners, formerly known as the Breast Cancer Fund. I want to thank the Commission for the opportunity to testify on the staff briefing package on the petition regarding products containing organohalogen flame retardants. Breast Cancer Prevention Partners is a national nonprofit organization committed to preventing breast cancer by reducing exposure to chemicals and radiation linked to the disease. Halogenated flame retardants are chemicals of significant concern to our organization. As we have previously outlined in our testimony and submissions on this petition, OFRs have been associated with serious health problems such as cancer, neurological impacts, reproductive impairments, endocrine disruption, and more. PBT 
PBDE's exposures have been found to affect the timing of puberty in adolescent girls and to promote proliferation of human breast cancer cells in vitro, both areas of concern to breast cancer risk. As you have heard previously, studies show that these chemicals migrate out of products into our homes and ultimately into our bodies. In reviewing the staff briefing package, we have identified several shortcomings that have contributed to a poorly considered recommendation to deny the underlying petition. In writing the briefing package, the staff adopted many of the arguments the chemical industry has used for decades to stymie and frustrate any meaningful regulation of the hundreds of toxic chemicals the public is exposed to daily. Here are our responses to just a few of those concerns. Toxicity data is incomplete, limited, or lacking. Arguing insufficient data is a staple of the industry playbook. Either not enough evidence exists or the studies that do show harm are for some reason irrelevant or suspect. Yet industry refuses to do the toxicity testing, fights tooth and nail against a minimum data set in TSCA reform, and then claims the government can't act to regulate a chemical due to lack of data. The petitioners have provided the commission more than sufficient toxicity data to act to protect the public health, which of course is your primary mission. Use of these chemicals is declining. Staff states that only 22% of tested products contain OFRs and that the market is moving away from their use. If one fifth of any other product category were deemed adulterated, the situation would correctly be declared a crisis. In addition, without federal regulation, companies are free to return to the use of these toxic chemicals. And most importantly, consumers, and particularly cancer survivors, with deep concern about exposing themselves and their families to flame retardants, have no way to know which products fall into that 22%. The Commission must act to ban these chemicals in 100% of the consumer products covered by the petition and not leave the public health up to the vagaries of the market. Lack of documented incidents. Staff concern, contends that there is insufficient data in the CPSC databases of consumer incidents to act on the petition. This contention highlights the bias of the agency toward acute harm at the expense of their requirement to consider chronic or long-term harm. By its very nature, breast cancer has a long latency period, period, usually measured in decades. While it's not possible to link a specific case of breast cancer to a specific exposure, due both to this long latency period between exposure and onset of the disease and the sheer number of chemicals we are exposed to every day, there is ample toxicological evidence of harm to allow, and in fact to require, the Commission to act. The chemical industry has long argued that if you can't show direct causation, you can't regulate the chemical. We need only look at the example of tobacco use to see the results of that strategy. Millions dead while the tobacco industry continues to make hundreds of millions of dollars in profit. The Commission should not adopt the same unreasonably high and ultimately dangerous standard here. Lack of data on societal cost of illness. The staff briefing contends that they do not have sufficient data to do a cost-benefit analysis for granting the petition. One minute it remaining. Always, it will always be easier to document the hard cost to industry of banning chemicals from certain products than it is to establish the economic benefit of disease prevention. Yet we can certainly track many of the medical and lost productivity costs for a disease like breast cancer. But how does one quantify the societal cost of the pain and suffering of the millions of women and men and their families facing a breast cancer diagnosis? We submit that those combined costs far outweigh whatever economic impact there may be on manufacturers being asked to simply stop using these chemicals. In summary, denying the position would be a failure by the commission to adequately protect public health. We urge the commission to reject the staff briefing package and approve the petition as it was submitted. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Dr. Singla? Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Vina Singla, and I am Director of Research Translation at the Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment at University of California, San Francisco. My research focuses on chemicals in the indoor environment and impacts on vulnerable populations such as pregnant women and children. Next slide. Slide two, um, PRE's mission is to create a healthier environment for human reproduction and development through advancing scientific inquiry, clinical care, and health policies that prevent exposures to harmful chemicals in our environment. Next slide. 
um, the Federal Hazardous Substances Act defines a hazardous substance, um, as you see here, and today I'll be focusing on the second part, the fact that exposure to hazardous substance um, occurs as a result of customary use. Next slide. So starting in the middle of the slide, um, we know that flame retardants and indoor air and dust lead to human exposures, as we've heard from many other um, testifiers today. And we want to understand kind of one step back from that, how the products in question in this petition, electronics, children's products, furniture, and mattresses, um, contribute to flame retardants and indoor air and dust and the subsequent human exposures. Next slide. Slide five. Um, so scientists use a framework known as the Bradford Hill factors to evaluate the evidence linking the potential cause and effect. So I'll briefly review some of the uh, evidence relating to the key factors today and refer the commissioner commissioners to my full written testimony for a, a more detailed description. So the factors are, do we see a gradient of effect? And what's the strength of the effect? Is it statistically significant? Is there a logical timing of the event? Does the cause perceive the effect? Is there consistency between studies? And do we have experimental evidence that's in coherence with the real world observations? Next slide. In this graph, we're looking at the HBCD level in dust on the left-hand side and distance from television set on the bottom. HBCD levels are highest in dust directly by the TV and levels drop dramatically as you move away from the TV. And other studies had similar findings with furniture and mattresses. This gradient of effect strongly suggests that these products are the sources of the flame retardant emissions to dust. Next slide, slide seven. In this study, researchers collected dust samples from mattresses and floors inside homes, and they found a statistically significant strong correlation between levels of brominated flame retardants and mattress dust and floor dust. The strength of this effect suggests that the mattress is a major contributor to the flame retardant loading in dust. And other studies made similar findings for furniture, electronics, and children's products. Next slide. In these graphs, we're looking at PBDE levels in dust on the left-hand side in relation to whether or not products are present. So in blue, you can see that when you remove a product containing flame retardants, the TV, the PBDE levels fell dramatically by almost 80%. On the other hand, you can see in orange that when you put a new product containing flame retardants into the room, the mattress, PBDE levels increased dramatically by about 2,000%. So this very clear relationship between the timing of the presumed cause and effect strongly suggests that these products are major contributors to flame retardant loading and dust. And similar results have been found with other kinds of products and other studies. Next slide. Slide nine, um, studies on these products and flame retardant emissions were conducted in the US, Canada, the EU, and New Zealand in different kinds of indoor environments, homes, child care centers, offices, and with different kinds of products. These studies all made similar findings about flame retardant emissions. One minute remaining. Into indoor dust and air. And the consistency of results across the different studies increases our, our confidence in the findings. Next slide. And then finally, we see this coherence between the results of the laboratory studies and real-world observations. In this study, the scientists found um, that the stool in experimental chamber emitted flame retardants directly into the chamber. And they found similar results with other kinds of products. So this is consistent with the real-world studies that find uh, these products contribute to flame retardant emissions. Next slide. In conclusion, considering the factors scientists used to evaluate linkages between cause and effect, there is a strong body of evidence showing that these products contribute to flame retardant le levels indoors and subsequent human exposures. This evidence also speaks to the fact that removing these flame retarded products from indoor environments has the potential to significantly lower human exposures to these chemicals. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Dr. Diamond. Thank you, Chair Burkle and Commissioners, for the opportunity to speak in support of the petition. I'm a professor of environmental chemistry at the University of Toronto in Canada. I've been studying and publishing on organohalogen flame retardants, or OFRs, since the early 2000s. Some of the testimony today has cited my lab's work. I will speak on three points. First of all, 
why should the Commission act to control OFRs as a class? All OFRs, or semi-volatile organic compounds, or SVOCs. SVOCs that are additive to a polymer inevitably and predictably migrate from their origin of that polymer to the surrounding environment that includes people. Migration of additive OFRs is an inherent property of the OFRs as a class. Today we're speaking of migration from four product categories to the surrounding environment. Indoors, where these products are located, additive OFRs migrate to preferentially accumulate in people and other fatty types of materials indoors. Migration can be through air or by direct transfer from the product. Specifically, those fatty or organic-rich constituents indoors are our skin, our clothing, and dust. Once again, migration of additive OFRs from products and accumulation on skin, clothing, and dust is inevitable and predictable. Finally, OFRs and other chemicals emitted indoors are persistent due to limited chemical degradation pathways. This leads me to point number two, the connection between levels of OFRs and products and dust. When the petition was tabled in 2015, to our best knowledge, it was dust that was the primary source of human exposure to OFRs as a class. But research, including our own, has advanced our understanding of exposure routes beyond that of dust. Dust is likely a surrogate or proxy for indoor routes of OFR exposure. Rather, we now understand that OFRs are transferred directly from products to hands, followed by hand-to-mouth contact. Also, our hands pick up contaminated dust, again, transferred by hand-to-mouth contact. We also understand that OFRs released from products into air inevitably and predictably accumulate on all bare skin and on our clothes. OFRs on skin and clothes contribute to exposure. To summarize, we now understand that OFRs follow multiple routes of exposure indoors and that dust is a reasonable surrogate for exposure. And the four product classes? I want to focus on OFRs in electronic casings. All electronic products that we've sampled, which is nearly 300 products, contain additive OFRs in their casings. We found a statistically significant relationship between levels of OFRs in products and OFRs in dust. That's Abbasi et al. 2016. Our recent data by Yang et al. Um, 2017 show a relationship between OFRs wiped from the surfaces of handheld electronic devices and their owners' hands. These devices include cell phones, tablets, home phones, and laptops. I've been watching the proceedings today on YouTube. I see many people are holding a cell phone. I see that kids at ever younger ages are handling electronic devices like cell phones that contain OFRs. The transfer of OFRs from handheld electronic devices to young kids, even toddlers, and to all of us handling these devices is inevitable. I appreciate the need to have fire safety. Testimony today has included comment that OFRs increase the safety of electronic products. I welcome peer-reviewed scientific evidence to show this, as I am not aware of such evidence. I conclude by supporting the petition. We know that OFRs migrate from products. There's strong evidence of widespread human exposure to OFRs as complicated mixed One minute remaining. individual chemicals. And there is strong evidence of their ability to cause multiple adverse effects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Curtis? I'm Kathy Curtis, Executive Director of Clean and Healthy New York. We thank the Commission for the opportunity to testify. Though more than a year and a half has passed since we last testified before this body on this subject, we remain convinced that it is important for the Consumer Product Safety Commission to approve the ban of organohalogen flame retardants in consumer products. Clean and Healthy New York has focused on flame retardant chemicals for over a decade, and my work significantly predates that. I led work to pass the New York State law banning Penta and Octa and creating a task force on flame retardant safety to explore alternatives to DECA. Uh, CHNY led the work to pass a first-in-nation ban on TCEP and subsequent expansion of the law to include TDCPP in New York State, two carcinogens. I coordinated the National Alliance for Toxic-Free Fire Safety in, from 2006 to 2014, and during that period, I helped shepherd federal DECA BDE phase-out, advance significant market shifts, and helped coordinate several state-level bans. 
I served on the EPA Design for the Environment Alternatives Assessment Partnerships for both DECA and HBCD, HBCD and was one of two advocates with the New York State Professional Firefighters Association appointed to New York's task force on flame retardant safety from 2005 to 2013. When I spoke in January 2016, I stated that 12 states took action on flame retardant chemicals. As of today, 14 states have adopted a total of 33 policies. 15 states have 22 pending policies in 2017, with a total of 23 states either having enacted laws or having pending legislation or both. And yet, despite state-level OFR pro prohibitions and market shifts, the use of toxic chemicals in home goods and con children's products continues, which is why federal action on the part of CPSC is required. In December 2015, the Safe Sofas and More campaign released the report, Flame Retardants in Furniture, Foam, and Floors, Leaders, Laggards, and the Drive for Change. We found that of the top furniture, mattress, and carpet padding manufacturers, there was a range of use of flame retardant chemicals. Only five of the 14 mattress companies reported being free of flame retardant chemicals. Here's what the executive summary said about mattresses. Five of 14 mattress makers reported not using flame retardant chemicals. Five reported not being actively flame retardant free. Four did not source flame retardant free foam and one did not offer clarity that their barrier was flame retardant free. One uses flame retardants in some products and not in others. Three did not provide information. Since the publication of that document, none of the mattress manufacturers have disputed these findings. Since January 1st, companies reporting to Washington State under their Children's Safe Products Act have reported 110 instances of flame retardant use in infant and children's products. This includes four reports of DECA BDE usage, one of which was at levels above 10,000 parts per million, two instances of hexabromocyclododecane, two instances of tetrabromobisphenol A, two, one instance of TDCPP, and one instance of TCEP. Further, unpublished third-party laboratory testing by the Getting Ready for Baby campaign, which CHNY coordinates, and the Center for Environmental Health in 2016 and 2017, have found halogenated flame retardants in polyurethane foam used in infant products. The flame retardants include tris 2 butoxyethyl phosphate and tris one chloro 2 propyl phosphate. In conclusion, state actions to ban certain flame retardants, while important, are not enough to avoid exposure and protect public health. State task force reports clearly show there are alternatives to halogens that are affordable, available, and effective. Additive flame retardants are still being reported. One minute remaining. Are thank you. Uh, additive flame retardants are still being reported in upholstered furniture, mattresses, infant and toddler products, and electronics, the four categories covered under the petition request. Markets may be shifting, but have not fully made the transition to safer methods of fire protection. For these reasons, and those stated by other supporters today, Clean and Healthy New York strongly supports a decision by the Consumer Product Safety Commission to protect the health of consumers by prohibiting the sale of products that contain organohalogen <clears throat> and retardant chemicals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Curtis. Uh, Dr. Herbstman? Good afternoon. Thanks very much for the opportunity to testify today. I am an epidemiologist uh, and associate professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. I'm affiliated with the Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health, the Columbia Center for Environmental Health in Northern Manhattan, and the Cancer Epidemiology Program at the Herbert Irving Comprehensive Cancer Center at the Columbia University Medical Center. Since 2002, I've been studying the impact of prenatal exposure to polybrominated diphenyl ethers, PPDE, flame retardants, and their effects on children's thyroid hormone levels and neurodevelopment. In my research, we've collected umbilical cord blood and have worked with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to measure PPDE components or congeners um, that are associated with the pentabrominated diphenyl ether or pentabDE mixture. I have found that in all of the neonates in my research studies in both Baltimore and in New York City, the children had detectable levels of at least one of the pentabDE congeners in their cord blood. We found evidence suggesting that prenatal exposure to pentabDE congeners impacts perinatal thyroid hormone levels, 
We also found that children who were exposed prenatally to higher concentrations of PENTA-BDE congeners relative to children in the study with lower exposure scored significantly lower on cognitive tests, including IQ tests, at ages four and seven, and these children with higher exposures also reported having more attention problems. Based on my research and the research of other investigators in the field, there is ample evidence indicating that prenatal exposure to PENTA-BDEs is associated with lower scores on indicators of both cognition, like IQ, and also increased number of behavior problems um, that are measured throughout childhood. Since PBDEs have been phased out of use in new, computer, uh, new consumer products, new compounds have been used instead. Some of these compounds are also organohalogen flame retardants, meaning that they are in the same chemical family as PBDEs um, and other flame retardants that have been phased out or banned previously, like brominated tris. We've recently studied homes in New York City where women and their uh, young children, three to five years old, live. Among all the women and the children we study, everyone was exposed to detectable levels of PBDEs as well as brominated flame retardant chemicals that are used as PBDE replacements, abbreviated as TBB and TBPH. While TBB and TBPH were detected on the hands of all the women and the children we studied, children had higher concentrations on their hands as compared to their mothers after accounting for differences in hand size. We also found that the amount of TBB and TBPH in house dust was associated with the amount of TBB, TBB and TBPH on the hands of the mothers and children living in these homes. Toxicological data has demonstrated that these PBDE replacements are biologically active. Studies from other researchers in the field have shown that these compounds can interact with nuclear receptors known as PPAR gamma, which are involved in adipogenesis and relevant to obesity. Other studies have demonstrated that exposure during pregnancy has altered maternal thyroid hormones and induced liver toxicity. Based on my own research and, the, and research of others in the field, I conclude that in households in the U.S. where pregnant women and children live, there are detectable levels of both PBDEs and their halogenated replacements. Ch children, infants, and fetuses are more vulnerable to the health effects resulting from exposure to a, a wide variety of environmental chemicals, including halogenated flame retardants. Therefore, it is my professional opinion that there is reason to be concerned that the entire class of orga organohalogen flame retardants may cause injury or illness to humans, particularly to fetuses and young children. Therefore, I support regulations designed to prevent human exposure to these chemicals from consumer products. Thanks very much for your attention and your time. Thank you very much. Dr. Zeller? Yes, good afternoon, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm a professor in the biology department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. My research over the past 25 years has been focused on understanding how thyroid hormone controls brain development and whether and how environmental chemicals like halogenated flame retardants can interfere with this action. It's first important to recognize that thyroid hormone is essential for brain development in the fetus, in newborns, and in children this fact is so well recognized that every baby born in this country is tested for normal functioning of the thyroid gland at, at birth. In some regions of the country, as many as 1 in 1,200 newborns have low thyroid hormone, and it's considered a medical emergency to ensure that they are identified and treated quickly to limit the cognitive deficits caused by low thyroid hormone during development. It's also become clear that thyroid hormone levels in pregnant women are important for development of the fetus, and this appears to be especially true in the first trimester when the <clears throat> fetal thyroid gland has not yet developed, but when thyroid hormone is still required for brain development. My research on halogenated flame retardants such as polybrominated diphenyl ethers, tetrabromobisphenol bisphenol A, and some perfluorinated chemicals has demonstrated that these chemicals can interfere with thyroid hormone in the developing brain, but in ways that we don't fully understand. Currently, the only tool we have to measure whether these flame retardants affect the human thyroid system is to measure blood levels of thyroid hormone. The work in my laboratory and the laboratory of others around the world has shown that some of these chemicals can interfere with thyroid hormone in brain in a manner that's not consistent with changes in blood levels of thyroid hormone. 
We've recently expanded this work to humans by testing whether halogenated chemicals can interfere with thyroid hormone actions in the placenta. We focused on the placenta for the obvious reason that it's a tissue that's available, but it's also a known target of thyroid hormone action. And it's likely that similar effects are occurring in the fetal brain. In collaboration with our Canadian colleague, doc, Dr. Larissa Taxer in Quebec, our findings are fully consistent with the conclusion that environmental chemicals, most likely halogenated flame retardants, can interfere with thyroid hormone action in humans without affecting hormone levels in the blood or in cord blood. This observation should be deeply concerning to everybody listening to this testimony because it means that common chemicals found in the home and workplace can affect the health of our children like a stealth bomber, flying below the radar of the ways we test, for, test chemicals for safety or study the impacts of these chemicals on human health. So in closing, it's clear to me that these halogenated flame retardants can and do affect human development in part by interfering with thyroid hormone during development. This conclusion is based on years of high resolution research that can't be duplicated for every single halogenated flame retardant. These chemicals are robbing our children and grandchildren of critical intellectual potential. And while these effects may not be visible on the faces of our children, they're no less important to them individually or to our society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Zeller, and thank you to all of our panelists for participating by phone. The commissioners will now ask uh, their five-minute round of questions, and I will begin the questions. Uh, and I will address this to uh, anyone on the panel who would like to uh, answer this. I'm going back to the recommendation from staff and the issues that they raised. Um, number one, that we do not have the data that would allow us to ban a class of chemicals uh, on specific chemicals. And so we lack data. There is a data gap. And we've heard this. It's been kind of a recurring theme throughout the day. And if anyone would like to comment on that, I would certainly appreciate hearing your thoughts. So this is Tom Zeller. If I could jump in very quickly with just a very brief response to that. And that is, I think that we should make recommendations and regulations based on what we know, not on what we don't know. So the fact that there is a data gap, and there will always be data gaps, should not restrict us from action. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam Dar Diamond. I'd like to add to that by saying that um, we understand um, the thermodynamics of how um, um, OFRs behave, and we know it's inevitable that they will migrate um, from products and uh, result in exposure. Thank you, Dr. Diamond. I guess my follow-up question to, be, to that would be whether we can show that that exposure would rise to a toxic level that would then cause the harm. Um, and that seems to be part of the discussion today. Uh, Dr. Zeller, I just wanted to go back to uh, what you said, and that is, um, <clears throat> I apologize, I just lost my train of thought on your comment. If you could just refresh my memory about what you just uh, said in response to my question. Sure. My, my main point was that we should base our regulations and our kind of decisions on what we know and not on what we don't know, because there will always be things that we don't know. Um, one of the main points that I wanted to make in my testimony is that we are now finding that chemicals like these halogenated flame retardants that have a chemical structure similar to that of thyroid hormone can actually affect the developing brain as well as other tissues without affecting blood levels. So that means when the government does a study and they don't see an effect on blood levels of thyroid hormone, they say that it's safe. And I don't think that that's um, a legitimate argument anymore. Thank you very much. And I'll just uh, follow that up with when you're a data-driven agency, understanding the uh, import and the possible exposure and, and toxicity of each chemical is important, and I think that is that is our struggle here. We have to rely on data. We can't assume because one chemical is part of a, a class of chemicals 
that then they're all uh, that they are all dangerous or create a hazard to the consumer. Dr. Uh, com excuse me, Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And following up on that, uh, Dr. Singla, uh, you've just heard uh, the chairman expressing this concern about the need for data gap fillers. In your written testimony, you mentioned scientific guidelines that have been used to fill in gaps in data, such as structure activity relationships and quantitative structure activity relationships. Uh, could you expand on that? And to your knowledge, have other health and safety agencies used techniques like this to fill in data gaps? Yes. Um, th thank you for, for the question. Um, the kind of methods um, you just mentioned, read across and um, tools for uh, assessing structure act activity relationships are well established in the regulatory sphere. So these are used by EPA's new chemicals program, for example, to make decisions on the hazards of chemicals based on, a, on, a, on their um, class or category they belong to, even without data on the specific chemical. And for um, organohalogen flame retardants in, in particular, um, the California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment did look at them as a class um, and had concerns about the, the to toxicity of the class and named the class um, as, a, as a concern for the biomonitoring program. So um, these methods are uh, well established in regulatory science and have been used to look at uh, chemicals as, as a class. Yeah, and following up on that, you said that the molecular characteristics of this class of flame retardants result in toxicity to humans with pregnant women and children being especially vulnerable. And so I guess the basic question is uh, whether the, is it your belief that the molecular characteristics are sufficiently common to all OFRs that they can be dealt with as a class? Yes, I, I would say that's, um, that's, that, that is correct in, in the fact that the uh, carbon halogen bond, so the bond between carbon and a bromine or a chlorine is what is the consistent feature of this class that imparts the exposure properties. So as we've heard that they will inevitably migrate um, out of products that add that semi-volatile organic chemical behavior. So it gives them those exposure properties as well as the toxicity properties, that propensity to enter cells and accumulate in fatty tissue and cause toxicity. Uh, Dr. Diamond, you cite a number of studies that demonstrate that exposure to uh, HFRs can occur from uh, ingestion of dust, hand-to-mouth transfer, dermal intake directly from air, clothing, and in inhalation. Some of these exposure routes seem more likely than others due to differential volatility of these chemicals. Does this suggest that some of these chemicals are likely to present minimal or no health risk? Um, well, let's just tease apart the, the components there of your question. So one is the migration and the exposure route, and the other is toxicity. My comments were, uh, were focused on exposure. Yes. And yes, depending on the exact chem properties, um, the chemicals will differ in the tendency to um, partition onto skin versus, say, stay in air, and, um, and um, to which we would be exposed more through inhalation. Um, the uh, because of the persistence and the and the um, sort of the um, internal um, uh, biological persistence of these compounds, the route of exposure does not um, appear to, or at least I am not aware that the route of exposure influences toxicity. No, not toxicity. I guess what I'm saying is taking the combination of toxicity and the route of exposure, does that lead you to conclude that any of the OFRs that we're concerned with uh, are not going to present a problem? In other words, uh, can we still treat them as a class? Yes, my conclusion was that we should and can treat them as a class because of these sort of basic thermodynamic properties. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ms. Curtis, you cite the statutes of a number of states regarding OFRs. You seem pessimistic that state action will adequately address the problem of hazardous OFRs. Is it your concern that not enough states will pass laws outlawing OFRs or that the states that ban certain OFRs will leave uh, so many others on the market that consumers will not be adequately protected? I like that uh, well, question. I, uh, the uh, concern is that children in Mississippi and Indiana and 
Wyoming are not necessarily benefiting from these laws, and that uh, they're not well enforced either. They're not really being adequately enforced uh, in a way that they could be by the federal government. So I think it would be best for manufacturers as well if there were a uniform approach uh, that covered the entire nation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Um, Dr. Single, I'm going to uh, direct these questions at you, but then Dr. Herbstman, I'd like your comments as well if you'd like to add anything. Um, uh, Commissioner Adler was just asking about the, the first concern that, that staff seemed to have uh, about data because there were two very distinct areas, and one was that the information that we have about the OF OFRs that are within um, this class uh, vary in toxicity and exposure, that is those that we know something about and a lot of them we don't know anything about. And Dr. Singler, you've told, um, in, in response to Commissioner Adler's questions, you've talked about well-established and well-accepted um, ways in which other agencies and scientists get, get past data gaps where it's appropriate and you told us about the, the different um, ways in which they do that with SARS and QSARS and read across. But let me ask you first of all a very basic question. Why is it important to have those methods to get past data gaps? I think it's important because you know, as, as Dr. Zoller mentioned, um, there's, there will always be some data gap or, or a level of uncertainty. We never have perfect data or all the data that we need to make the decision. And it's important to be able to move forward um, in the face of uncertainty to, to make decisions and put protections in place that, that are needed. So I think those, those tools are um, Im important and um, have been validated for that purpose. Um, by scientists and other agencies. Uh, so I think it, it's also important to consider um, the standard we're thinking about and the decision to be made. So in, in this case, we're thinking about the potential to cause harm or um, you know, if, if these chemicals um, may cause the uh, substantial injury or illness. And I think um, in thinking about the level of evidence needed to meet that standard that um, these tools do provide uh, that level of evidence that this class of chemicals um, may cause harm. Okay, and, and if you use these well-established, scientifically accepted methods of getting um, around data gaps that so many others have used, um, why do you think if we applied those here it would be appropriate to put these OFRs into a class? I think the, and when you think about um, creating a chemical class or category, you look at common structural or, structural or molecular features um, as well as common exposure pathways. And the OFRs do have those in common as a class. Thank you. And Dr. Herbstman, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I first I agree with everything that Dr. Singla said and, and what others have said earlier today. Um, it's just un it's, it's really unrealistic to expect that we are going to be able, we as a scientific community are going to be able to evaluate every single chemical that's put into commerce. It's just not, it, it's, it's just not possible. And the, the case in point, I can speak to my own research, started looking at PBDEs and then have moved into PBDE replacements, but we're just, sort, we're, we're behind where what's already in circulation. And so this way of being so reactionary is not serving us it's not serving us well. And so using the methods that Dr. Singla described, Dr. Birnbaum described earlier, you know, we can understand how similar different compounds are to one another um, and draw across the entire class and use weight of evidence, which is what we use in epidemiology, toxicology, to sort of make a determination about the toxicity of any particular compound. Because it's, it's truly is not, not realistic to expect that we're going to be able to test every single compound. It's an unrealistic expectation. Thank you. And the second area of concern that staff had was that the presence of OFR chemicals in household dust um, does not establish a link to the four product categories that petitioners have identified. 
Um, Dr. Singla, do you have anything that you could add that would address that concern? Yes, the, um, some of the, the data that um, I, I presented in my slide speaks to that very issue that um, we have studies linking those particular products, um, furniture, mattresses, children's products, electronics, um, to the levels of flame retardants in the indoor environment, in dust or air. So those studies do show a very specific connection, um, to example, a, a television or a mattress or a laptop computer um, being in a room and the levels of flame retardants in air or dust. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of you. Thank you. Commissioner Kay? Thank you, Madam Chair. Does anybody on the panel have any data whatsoever or can cite any study or any government finding that would exonerate any of any organohalogen? Nothing? We're hearing just silence. And how about Dr. Diamond? Um, In Canada, Dr. Diamond, one of the prior uh, panelists mentioned that Canada may have exonerated an organohalogen. Are you aware of that? Yes, I am. So it's TBBPA, and under the um, Canadian um, Chemical Management Plan, under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, um, the conclusion was that, it, um, that TBBPA could not be classified as toxic. But I want to add that, um, and I'll quote from the report, although there is currently limited exposure in Canada to TBBPA and its concentrations currently in the environment are not indicative of harm to organisms in Canada, there may be concerns if new activities were to occur. Um, so I uh, return to what Heather Stapleton said earlier, TBBPA is used 90% as a reactive flame retardant rather than an additive. The fact that the, um, the adjudication was based on exposure, not on hazard, is um, likely um, due to the fact that it's used as a reactive and not additive flame retardant. There is some use of TBBPA as an additive flame retardant, and should that um, increase, then um, under the Canadian Chemical Management Plan, uh, the adjudicators would return to that decision and reevaluate. I see. And this is for you or anybody else on the panel. Is there anything uh, about the chemical structure of TBBPA that would lead you to believe that if it were used in additive form that it would not present a hazard? Nobody wants to opine on that? Well, let me ask it, it in a different way. Does anyone believe that it would not present a hazard based on its chemical formulation if used in an additive manner? This is uh, Bina Singla. I, I just I want to comment on the the opposite of that. Actually, the, the chemical structure would lead me to have a lot of concerns about its toxicity because it's um, it's the chemical structure is bisphenol A or BPA with four bromines on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I would like to echo this, yeah. Miriam Diamond. I would like to echo that comment. And there is ample evidence now of the um, exposure, certainly, and adverse effects caused by um, bisphenol A. Got it. So if, as a layperson, if I'm understanding you correctly, Dr. Diamond, you're saying that it's purely because of the way that it's been used as, in a reactive manner that has probably led to the conclusion by Canada at this juncture. That's correct. Based on exposure, not on hazard. Got it. Thank you. And Dr. Zoller, I really very much appreciate the way you defined what our charge should be that we should act based on what we know, not based on what we don't know. And I don't think that there's any inconsistency between that and the idea that we are a data-driven agency because I think as you look at the data that has been presented from the petition through the pu first public hearing, the first public comment, all the way through till now, I think the data is actually overwhelming. And I think the data is overwhelming on every single point. And so one can always say there's not enough information, but in any uh, trier of fact, I don't think that I'm not aware of any time where there's a 100% uh, a proof standard. There's always going to be doubt, whether it's criminal cases or civil cases or a regulatory decision. And I think in this case, as I mentioned, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence on every single point. And I don't agree with the characterization that the Federal Hazardous Substances Act does not give us the ability to move forward as a class. I think that it clearly does give us the ability. That's up for us to decide how we would want to do it. And it also gives us the flexibility if we wanted to create an exemption process at some point. If it turned out that we ended up 
ensnaring one chemical, one organohalogen that down the line could be proven to be safe. There's no reason why we couldn't build in some process to allow that upon the right proof to be exempted. Certainly, we have done that in the past. We did not require proof of every single plastic to have phthalates in it before we banned phthalates or the Congress banned phthalates. It was done across the board and exemptions were created. And so I am hopeful that my colleagues have uh, heard similar to what I've heard today, have felt the same level of concern, and that after this we'll move forward in a way that's protective of children in particular. And if one's going to make a mistake, if one, I'll close on this, if at the end of the day we look back on this decision and say we made a mistake, I'd far rather us make the mistake that ends up being too protective of children than one that pulls short of that. So thank you very much, Ms. Gardner. Thank you very much, Ms. Weintraub, and the rest of your coalition for bringing this petition to our attention, and I hope you do it justice. Commissioner Mohorovic. No questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by saying thank you to this last uh, number six panel today. Thank you for sharing and lending your expertise to this agency. We greatly appreciate your time and your effort in preparing not only for your written testimony, but for being here um, via phone for this afternoon's hearing. Thank you all very much. For the record, I also want to note that in addition to today's presentations, we have received written comments from the International Sleep Products Association, American Home Furnishings Alliance, and Kids in Danger. In addition to their oral testimony today, we also received additional written testimony from the National Resources uh, Defense Council, the Green Science Policy Institute, and the American Chemistry Council. I also want to acknowledge once again our staff who has been here with us all day and who helped facilitate this meeting, the Office of the Secretary, including Acting Secretary Alberta Mills, Ms. Rocky Hammond, our General Counsel Mary Boyle, um, and um, the Office's Executive Director, um, Shelley Covell, and sitting in for our Executive Director today, Mr. Dwayne Ray. John McGugan, uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for managing all of these uh, audiovisual um, efforts today. We do appreciate that. Um, I want to just make one last comment about today's hearing. Um, I want to take the f a few minutes to thank the staff for the briefing package. Um, although our staff's work was complemented throughout the day, I think a lot of it um, you know, was called into question and in the reasoning behind it. And what I want to say that may not be aware of some folks who don't follow CPSC very closely is that the commission directives actually limit what staff can do when we receive a petition. Uh, and it, it limits the amount of time staff can spend on a petition before it is granted or act, acted upon by the commission. And so to think that the staff's briefing package was their work in totality is not an accurate depiction of the staff's work. They are limited into what they can do when they bring that briefing package up in response to a petition. And I also just want to emphasize that the staff makes an independent judgment and a recommendation, and I congratulate them for providing a very useful package for which the commissioners will base their decision upon. And in addition to uh, the limited time factor for responding to a petition and making a recommendation to the commission, staff also has to take into account other issues, uh, some of those being uh, resources and other priorities that the commission has established. So they balance all of those factors into their briefing package to the commission. And I just want to say thank you to all the staff who prepared that briefing package and made it a very useful document for us. Uh, and I guess uh, one last thing, I'm guessing that if our toxicologists could and time and money was unlimited, they'd love to take a whack at these, but it's just the reality of the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, once again, thank you to all of uh, you and to thank you to my colleagues for what I think is a very uh, beneficial and good hearing today. Thank you.